Welcome to the A Sound Effect Podcast, the podcast about sound effects. My name is Espen Andersen and I'm the founder of asoundeffect.com. And I'm Christian Halske, founder of Hertz & Bits Sound Effects. We have some really interesting people on the show today. Christian, can you tell us about that? Right. For this episode, Jennifer Walden spoke to Max Lackman from Pole Position Production, which many of you may know for their sound libraries featuring all kinds of driving machines, cars, trucks, uh, tanks, planes, helicopters, and they have made a lot of them. So she talks to them about how they got started and uh, some of their libraries and so on. So that should be really interesting. Absolutely. Their libraries are really amazing. Yeah. So Jennifer also spoke to Benny Graf from a company called Accentize. Uh, and they uh, they do some really interesting stuff with machine learning and audio post-processing. So definitely stick around for that one. Very good. As always, there are some great new releases from the independent sound effects community. Can you share a few details about them? Absolutely. Uh, this time I am looking at libraries featuring things like uh, giant metal springs, Japanese bullet trains, mm -hmm. and uh, something called Arctic trailers. Oh, so that should be interesting. Absolutely. Japan Bullet Trains by the Sound Archivist is a collection of exterior recordings and interior ambiences of a variety of Japanese bullet trains, including passbys, arrivals, idols, departures, and ride ambiences. Arctic Trailer by Niklas Oren is a pack of sound effects made from recordings of ice, snow, and freezing wind, captured in Lapland, designed specifically for trailers and other dramatic moments. V7 Sonic Springs by Katrine Amsler features recordings of a metal spring instrument, which includes a giant 33-foot spring and was played with a bow, friction mallets, whipped cream gas canisters, and a souvenir Eiffel Tower, among other things. Next up, Jennifer Walden speaks to Benny Graf from Accentize. Hey, this is Jennifer Walden here with Benny Graf of Accentize, an audio processing software developer based in Germany. Accentize approaches audio processing a bit differently. They use machine learning to create intelligent algorithms for solving audio issues like dialogue enhancement and restoration, reverb removal, and automatic EQ correction for spectral imbalances, like when your talent goes off mic or changes proximity to the mic, or you're dealing with multiple takes from multiple sources, and they all sound different. Benny's here to talk about how machine learning and AI can be used for processing in audio post. Hey, Benny, thanks for joining me. So you're a digital signal processing engineer at Accentize, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. I, I studied um, signal processing and yeah. So that's what I am. Awesome. So tell me a bit about yourself and how you got into machine learning. Um, well, first of all, um, I I have always been interested in, in music and audio production. And that's like how I found my way into um, yeah, doing machine learning for it. Because um, during my studies, I came into contact with software development and at a later stage, also with machine learning and artificial intelligence and then I somehow um, managed to combine those two passions, like the, the music audio production thing and the techniques I learned during my studies. And yeah, I really enjoy um, doing those two parts now jointly. So let's talk about using machine learning for processing and audio post. Uh, but first, you know what, let's cover the basics. What is machine learning and how can that be useful for developing audio processing tools? Oh, okay. 
Um, well, first of all, um, I really like that you say machine learning and not AI because <laughs> there's lots of confusion about this and like um, lots of people are talking about AI and machine learning and actually I think no one really knows what's the difference between those two. So I prefer using the term machine learning for what I do in audio. So machine learning um, basically describes a, a technique to learn from data so to learn some kind of system or algorithm um, from data so in the in the old-fashioned way you have a task at hand which you want to solve and then you would fine-tune by hand your algorithm in a way that it somehow behaves that way and machine learning is a new approach to it um, which uses a bunch of ex example data to learn this behavior so um, the algorithm itself looks at lots of data examples and try to um, yeah tries to achieve the behavior to for example if you have a set of input data and a set of output data it tries to generate the output from the input. And how can this be helpful for building audio processing tools to help the audio post industry? Um, yeah, there I basically see two sections where it can be used one is like creative tools so it can be used to to generate or get new ideas or inspirations so if you're um, like a composer or something you can get new um, chord progressions or melody ideas which you can then fine-tune for your production um, the other part would be the um, yeah, time-saving tools to achieve a faster workflow or to automate repetitive tasks, simplify things, and then you can focus on the on the core creative part yourself and don't waste so much time on um, yeah, cleaning up audio or, or finding a word in a long interview. You can just um, use voice recognition, for example, to directly spot it. That's also where I um, focus on like to, to build um, time-saving tools for the audio production. So let's look at some specific applications of machine learning for audio post. You created a program for Boom called D-Bird, which removes bird chirps from ambience recordings. How did this idea come about and what were some of your challenges in creating a tool that removes birds but keeps the integrity of the original recording? Um, well, before starting Accentize and um, working for, for the audio production industry, I worked for a hearing aid company. So um, there we built algorithms which could be deployed in hearing aid to reduce ambient noise and all sorts of things. And then later after um, I quit that job, I came in contact with Boom and they told me about this problem in field recording that you've always birds in every recording you do. And um, that it's really time consuming to get rid of those bird chirps. And that's like one of those time saving tools I mentioned earlier. Um, and yeah, the idea behind this was to automate this process to recognize what is the bird um, sounds and what is the actual target signal which you intend to record. And then we collected a bunch of example data and tried to learn this behavior which people um, before did by hand. So the algorithm automatically could spot just the, um, in the frequency spectrum the, the bird noises and uh, suppress them. And how long did it take to perfect the algorithms that go into this tool? Um, the biggest part of the work is actually the data collection. So you need a lot of very high quality data because if your data is not good the algorithm or the learned behavior cannot be good so this is a huge part of it um, to get the right data and once you have the right data um, the training part itself um, takes about a week i would say per per algorithm and but then you it's a lot of trial and error so you will the first algorithms won't work and then you have you have to fine-tune train again see how it goes so yeah and so your next pursuits were figuring out how to leverage machine learning for reverb removal uh, automatic eq and dialogue enhancement so let's start with reverb removal i mean having too much room on a recording i mean that could potentially ruin a take and this has been an industry-wide issue like forever 
So there's been several tools in the past few years that deal with this issue, but what makes Accentize's D-Room plugin stand out from the crowd? I think there's more um, products who actually uh, use machine learning. I don't know if it's for reverb removal, for, for noise removal. I know there's different ones. Um, yeah, I, I think what makes it stand out is that it really can keep a natural sound because um, it's trained um, by listening to lots of natural, clean recordings. And so it, it really it is really fine-tuned to achieve this clean, dry sound in the end. And um, the problem is with, with other approaches, like if you try to um, handcraft an algorithm for that, it doesn't sound that natural. So you have more artifacts in it. And so what were some of your benchmarks for success with D-Room? Uh, like, when did you feel like, okay, this is exactly how I want this plugin to perform, and you basically stopped tweaking it? Uh, that's Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Because um, what you usually do when building a machine learning algorithm, you have some form of metric which tells you automatically how good it is or how bad it is. For, for example, in a image recognition um, algorithm it's very easy to say if it's the correct um, label which was put on if it's a cat or a dog for example it's really easy to say if it's good or wrong for the audio application it's way more difficult because it's so subtle differences and in the end you cannot make this automatically you need an audio expert who listens to it and says if it's better or worse and um, I luckily have lots of um, friends and also partners who are really good at um, audio production. And usually I send them a prototype algorithm. They listen to it and let me know if it's good or bad. And then I can decide if I have to fine tune it more and more. And um, yeah, for D-Room, it took a few iterations, but um, we got pretty quickly at a point where people said that sounds really great. Cool. So let's talk about spectral balancing. Uh, this corrects issues like proximity effect and off-axis issues and can make the EQ curve of one recording match another. So how did you use machine learning to help develop this tool and what were some of the challenges you had to overcome to achieve a successful result? Um, for the spectral balancing it's also a time-saving tool that you don't have to EQ every take by hand and that it automatically tries to find imbalances and um, correct them. And there it was also, um, the challenge was to get the right data. So we, we needed lots of not well EQ'd um, material and also the well EQ'd part, um, which we want to have in the end. Um, and then, like in D-Room, we built a machine learning algorithm who learned this mapping to get from the not well acute part to the good sounding part. And the main challenge is always to make this thing robust so that it works on all possible audio signals. Because in the training phase, it's always a limited amount of data you have. You can never feed it all the data there is in the world. So um, there's always unseen scenarios. And... You have to make sure that it reacts in a way which is pleasant to the ear and um, that it doesn't mess up the recording. So I feel like it must have been more challenging to do the spectral balance plugin as opposed to reverb removal. Um, because, you know, it's easier to identify when there's a tail or when there's a ring out on a sound. But EQ differences, you know, I just feel like that would probably be harder to identify if it's not like a trained ear listening to it. And it's a computer algorithm trying to figure out like, well, what is this EQ curve supposed to be? Yeah, that's 100%. Um in the, the EQing part is way more subjective. So for reverb data, it's pretty easy to say yes there is a reverb or no there's no reverb but for the eq part um, for different productions you would want a different eq curve sometimes you want to have the the low end uh, very pronounced sometimes you don't want it and um, there we need to come up with a kind of a definition for a neutral recording which more or less works in in every scenario but and and this is what comes out after spectral balancing, and then you can still fine tune it with a, with a second EQ or something. But um, yeah, for sure, that was more challenging. 
So let's look at the last one on the list, Dialogue Enhance. Uh, this is an automatic speech processing tool. It applies noise reduction, auto EQ, dynamic reduction, and loudness boost. Again, there are so many options on the market for handling these types of processes. What is unique about Accentize's approach? Um, that it's in a very automatic fashion. So you have, like, especially Dialogue Enhance, you just have four parameters to, to fine tune. That's all. Usually with audio production tools, you have lots of parameters to, to tune. And um, in Dialogue Enhanced, this is a combination of um, the, the noise reduction, the voice gate um, product we had, and also there's also a spectral balancing in there. And it sort of combines all the things you need if you um, want to improve um, the quality of your speech recordings. So just one last question here. What's next? How can machine learning further improve the quality of audio signal processing? Uh, what's over the next horizon? Um, well, for now, we are working on some new ideas, but it's never sure how well it will work in, in the end. We have lots of ideas or lots of visions of what we want to achieve, but um, lots of them, we, we realize that it's currently not possible with the tools we have at hand. Um, what we'll definitely um, want to do is to further improve the um, algorithms of the existing plugins. For example, the DRoom plugin, there's still some situations where it doesn't um, work um, as intended or there's still some um, reverb tail left. And luckily, uh, lots of our customers, they let us know if they come up with an example where it doesn't work and then they explain in what scenario it didn't work well or they sent us the, the audio clip. And yeah, that's definitely um, what's going to happen in the future is to improve further the, the algorithms they are. But we are also working on, on a few new algorithms, but I don't know how, yeah. Um, which ones are, are going to end up in an actual product in the end. Okay, all right. So a little top secret product development. You want to talk <laughs> about them? <laughs> um, well, I don't want to promise anything which I can keep in the end. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then people email you like, hey, Benjamin, where's that cool uh, plugin you were promising? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Cool. Um, well, thank you so much for having this chat with me today. Um, I really appreciate you taking some time out to talk with me. Thank you for inviting me. Next up, Jennifer Walden speaks to Max Lachman from Pole Precision Productions. Hey, this is Jennifer Walden for a sound effect, back with another featured sound creator podcast, where we get to know a bit about the people who design the amazing sound libraries on a sound effect. Today, we are talking with Max Lachman from Pole Position Production, which currently offers over 240 sound libraries on a sound effect. So those familiar with Pole Position know them for their vehicle recording work. They've captured everything from military vehicles, like World War I planes such as the German Fokker D7 and World War II tanks like the Russian T-3485, to luxury sports cars like the Lamborghini Aventador and vintage sports cars like the 1972 Porsche 911 ST. They've recorded smaller vehicles too, like hovercrafts and snowmobiles and bumper cars and dirt bikes. And it's quite an impressive range. So Max, thank you so much for joining me. Can you tell me a bit about Pole Position Production and who's on the team there with you? Yep, sure. Pole Position Production is an audio outsourcing company. We do sound design and we implement sounds in games. We do linear post-production as well, and we do music and also work on some industry applications like simulators and similar stuff. And then of course we do field recording and libraries. The team is now eight people regularly and we have another couple of people that come and go. So it's me who is now a CEO doing some hands-on work, but mostly just managing stuff. And then we have one of the other co-founders, Matt, who is our composer. We have Bernard, who's the third co-founder, and he's more like a senior advisor nowadays and a recordist. And then we have Niklas, co-owner nowadays, sound designer. Linus, who works as a COO and a coordinator, and he's actually a game producer from the beginning, and he's managing like meetings and recordings and sourcing and stuff like that. It's really, really helpful to have a guy like that. And we have Eric, who is a sound designer who comes from the film world. So that's a great contribution to our team. 
he's very used to telling stories using audio, which is not as common in games. Uh, and then we have Robin who's become our vehicle expert when it comes to sound design and the recordings. We have Paul who works from Bangkok. He's our sound editor and manages the libraries and our sound shop. And recently our programmer Johan uh, joined the team as well. And he's helping some of our customers, but he's also looking at plugins, which is exciting. And then we have two juniors as well, Daniel and Robert, who's helping out on bits and pieces. Awesome. So Max, how did you get started in the sound industry and where did you get your start? I started out studying music. I was a guitar player. And after that, I ended up as a trainee at the Polar Studios. And that's where I met Bernard, actually, is one of the co-founders of Pole Position today. After that, I did some freelancing as an engineer and as a musician. Then Bernard was looking at starting a music production company. So I joined him for that. And that was actually Pole Position production from the beginning. We did songwriting and producing songs and stuff like that. Eventually, we ended up in the game business. It's like the slip of the banana peel, as we say in Swedish. I'm not sure if that's an English expression. Mm, no, I, I don't think so, but it totally makes sense. So you guys went from music production to field recording. How did that happen? Well, uh, Bernard was a race driver back then. He was racing in the Swedish GT series in a Porsche. Uh, and one of his competitors on the track was actually a game developer making racing games. And since Bernard is quite well known as an engineer, this competitor asked Bernard if he was interested in making sounds for the racing games. Uh, and we jumped on it. We had no clue about anything back then. We started really from scratch, having to find out everything from zero. So it's been quite a trip, but it's been great fun. That's how it started. That makes a lot of sense because Pole Position has put out numerous vehicle-themed effects libraries. I mean, everything from tanks to bumper cars. So what are some of the things that you've learned from recording such a wide variety of vehicles over the years? Uh, it's been a really long learning experience, I would say. Anything from trying to find out the right gear. As, as I mentioned, we had no clue about anything when we started. We had to figure out what recorders are around that runs on batteries, what microphones do we have? Do they handle the pressure? And all of that. So we really started from knowing nothing. There was no forums or anything that we could reach out to. We didn't even know other people were doing the same thing. I mean, obviously people were, but we didn't think of that. We were just finding our own way of doing things. So everything from equipment and microphones to preparations and research about the locations, about the vehicles to how to pack your bags in case you lose them on flights, to uh, which gaffer tape is safe to use on a Ferrari, and how you talk to people on location to get the material that you need and to not have people walk around and talk when you record. Initially, when we started out, we could go one person to record three cars in a day. Today, we are a team when we do that because we capture so much more material. It's so much more thorough in every way. So it's really grown in every aspect and the quality is so much better today. You've recorded some really interesting vintage military vehicles, like all those tanks from World War II. That must have been so difficult to track them down. But, you know, at the same time, it must have been really fun to record them. Tanks are fun for sure. It is a challenge to access them. You need to contact museums. Sometimes it's hard to to communicate the same language and so on. Once you record them, it's actually pretty straightforward. You, it's quite easy to rig them. You don't have to be too careful about the paintwork and it's easy to mount stuff and so on, which is always good with tanks. can be extremely hot to be inside them if it's a sunny day in Texas, for instance, but it's great fun to record them. They have the most scary sound on the distance when they approach you with the tracks against the ground and you can feel the ground start shaking. It's quite an experience. So of all the vehicle effects collections you've produced, which one was the most challenging or which one was the most rewarding for you personally and why? For me personally, the biggest success and the one I appreciate the most must have been the Messerschmitt ME109 because it took me actually a couple of years to get access to it. Uh, a lot of emailing, a lot of no from different people and eventually just finding the right person who 
helped me out in every aspect. So from getting a total blank, no, you can't do it. We are saving our engine time. Two years later, we had a full day of recording just us and the plane on a beautiful day in Germany. And that was quite a feeling. And it's an amazing sounding plane when it comes flying over your head at a high speed. So that was really cool. Was this a personal project, a plane that you personally wanted to capture, or was this a plane that you ended up capturing for a game like um, Microsoft's Flight Simulator 2020? That was a plane that I had a question on it, but I mean, it took me two years to find it, so I didn't think I would actually get it. But once it was possible to get it, we just went anyway, because you can't miss out on that opportunity. I think there's five of them flying, and they are very rare. It was also used eventually in Dunkirk, for instance, by Richard King, because there are not that many authentic recordings around. You've also created a plugin called Grip for designing vehicle tires and chassis sounds for motion pictures, so uh, games and film productions. Can you talk about how this plugin came about? Yep, sure. I was at one point working with Ambiences at Avalanche Studios, and the audio director they had at that place, Magnus, who's a brilliant person and a good friend had set up a really, really cool ambience system. And I started to think in terms of why don't film use this to put audio to film? Because it's so versatile and just very easy to follow camera and all of that. And that thought kind of lingered with me for quite some time. So eventually I started to think of how we could use game technology for a film and Grip was kind of a proof of concept for that, since it's a very small and controlled area. So I wanted to be able to control speed and distance, camera angle, and panning, of course, to follow picture and see if we could do a plugin instead of having people looking in sound libraries and cutting and pasting and all of that. Uh, and I think it worked out quite well. So hopefully we can do more products in the same line. And who did you collaborate with to make this happen? Was this completely in-house or did you like reach out to other people who have experience with creating plugins? Since we didn't have a programmer at the time, we reached out to our friends uh, at Boom that we have done some other collaborations with. People that are awesome and we like them very, very much. We reached out to them. And they helped us out with all the programming and UI stuff and did a great job also on the quality aspect, checking out that everything worked and sounded very decent and uh, at even level. So at Pole Position, you've done more than vehicle recordings. You do a lot of weapons recordings um, and ambience recordings. For instance, you recently created a library called the Frozen Lake Library. That sounds like a really interesting recording trip. Can you tell me about it? Yeah, sure. It actually started out a year ago or something when we went to visit friends in their cabin. And they told me that you should have been here the other day because the ice was making such a fantastic sound. It's like singing in the mornings. So I was a bit sad. I missed that. And I told them that, please call me when it happens again. Uh, and a year later, they did call me and said, OK, it's happening again. And the thing is that after a long winter, when there's ice on the lake, and it's starting to heat up when spring comes, then you can have really cold night with freezing degrees. And during day, the sun comes up and heats up the ice. And then it starts cracking and singing. And it's a really, really cool sound. It's, it's really like the ice is singing. And then those amazing cracks that you can hear from far, far away, coming closer and closer or the other way around. So when that started to happen, I did have a look at the weather forecast to see when it would be a really cold night followed by a warmer day. And then we went there. I brought my family since we have friends there. And I went out early in the morning and set everything up and recorded. We have a really cool rig that we have set up to make ambiences that can be used for Atmos. So it's a 704 setup. 
So I did use that to make it like an ambience, but I also had some other microphones that were close to the eyes, so to speak, and that could be used in a different way. And that's what we have released as a library right now, because we did a lot of performed effects where we were like bending the eyes, breaking the eyes, throwing things at the eyes and so on. But we also have hours of recordings just of the ambience with the ice singing and cracking. And did you dig any holes in the ice uh, to capture what it would sound like under the ice as well? Yes, it's recorded from above the ice and also with the two hydrophones below the ice. The hydrophones are really, really cool because they get very, very clear. You don't have any birds, any wind or anything. And you can also hear sounds from extremely far away beneath the ice. So it's a really, really cool perspective. And what about weather-wise? Did you face any challenges with having the gear being that cold or close to water? No, not really. As the sun comes out, it gets quite warm. And that's the whole thing. It has to get warm for the ice to start vibrating and cracking. So it's actually an extremely nice recording condition. You go out, you set everything up, you switch record, and then you check it three times that it's actually recording. uh, And then you leave for some time. And then you just wait and wait and wait and wait. And eventually I went down to see that everything was still running a couple of hours later. Uh, And it was. And the sound changes during these hours. It can get more intense. The wind can pick up. It really changes during this time. So it's worth recording for quite some time. So Pole Position Production has been in business for over 20 years now. And Pole Position itself uh, has had quite an evolution over the years. Where do you see things going for you in the future? That's a good question. We try to do good stuff. I know we are considered to be pricey, but we try to be really high quality. We try to improve the quality all the time. We try to talk to our customers on what they think we might be missing what we can improve on Uh, we appreciate feedback so today we have our libraries that are multi-channel it's a lot of maneuvers content or depending on what kind of things we are recording we deliver them with pro tools and reaper sessions where everything is lined up and with location markers and so on we also have metadata in different languages We try to include impulse response stuff when possible. Uh, So we try to add as much content as possible. And we just want to keep improving on that. We have been looking a lot on how to group tracks, if it's better to do multi-channel files and so on, and are doing some middle ground solution now we've found from talking to different customers and also from different industries since it seems like sound designers in the game industry and in the film industry have a bit of different uh, preferences. So we just want to keep improving the libraries and do more libraries. And is there a future library that would be a great personal project for you? Like, is there something that you would just love to go out and capture the sound of? Always Formula One cars and spaceships. Cool. You might get more of a chance for that with uh, SpaceX and uh, yes. <laughs> Jeff Bezos' uh, Blue Origin. That's always something I would like to do. And we also do a lot of recordings with the military joint exercises and record with them. And that's also very exciting stuff. So I guess you're able to talk about the military stuff more than the game industry stuff, huh? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I can't show pictures or stuff usually, but we've been lucky to have very good connections within the military and they are really nice taking us along. So we recently recorded and released a library that we call Warfare 2 that has a lot of explosions from mines and claymore and stuff like that. And also uh, huge, huge cannons uh, with amazing tails. I think it's like 30 second tales with no birds or anything. It must be really tricky to record a mine because, of course, you know, you want to get your equipment close. But, uh, you know, then again, it throws all that debris. So how do you protect your gear from the debris? The debris is part of the sound, I would say. You want the crack and you kind of want the debris as well. But you also need to have stuff close and also further away, of course. And you don't want the debris to actually hit the microphones if possible, but it's unavoidable, I would say. 
we did lose one microphone when shrapnel hit the microphone something that you prefer not to happen but it's really hard to know beforehand it's kind of a risk you need to take as well right you can't really predict where it's going to explode outward no and then you can of course shield it more in hindsight maybe i should have put that microphone a bit more to the left and then i know it would have been better protected on the other hand we had our sonosax recorder in a flight case and that flight case was completely penetrated by shrapnel as well and we didn't foresee that because it was behind bags of sand so i thought it was well protected but it obviously it was not the recorder was okay though Oh, good. So I guess the case uh, must have did its job. It did. Awesome. So Max, thank you so much for joining us for this podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time out to share your story with us. It was my pleasure. Thank you for reaching out. That's it for this episode. A big thanks to Jennifer Walden for doing the interviews and to Max Lackman and Benny Graf for being on the show. Looking for more audio-related podcasts to listen to? We're part of the Audio Podcast Alliance, featuring a hand-picked selection of the very best podcasts about sound. So be sure to hear the latest episodes from our friends in the community at audiopodcast.org. Be sure to subscribe to the Soundfic Podcast. Thanks a lot for listening, and see you next time. Take care. <laughs>